Hi there, and welcome to Red Sparks Crypto Blog, a place for all things blockchain, crypto, and my favorite coin, Cardano. If you like this content, please be sure to tap that thumbs up and gently hit the subscribe button. It goes a long way to getting this channel off the ground. Today, we will be talking about a question that I've been asked a lot. Is Haskell, the programming language behind Cardano's smart contracts, hard to learn? Now, before I dive into it, I think it's important to let you know what my general level of experience is with computer programming. On the one hand, I've been coding on and off for 20 years and I've dabbled in a whole host of languages with Visual Basic, C Sharp and Python being my main ones. But on the other hand, my heavy duty coding experience as a professional C Sharp programmer only lasted a few years as I got into data science and so my more recent experience has just been in Python. And I've never really gotten into Java. Too many curly brackets and boilerplate code for my liking. However, I think I'm a good representative of your average programmer. With that said, let's dive in. Part 1. Is Haskell slash Plutus hard to learn? Haskell is a mainstream programming language that has been around since 1990. And Plutus is a version of it that has been built for smart contract programming on Cardano. I'm going to mostly refer to it all as Haskell for the purposes of this discussion. One key point to understand about Haskell is that it falls under the family of programming languages known as functional programming. Whereas most programmers learn to code in imperative or procedural, which is another name for it, languages such as Java or Python. More on the merits of one over the other later. Now on the Cardano Reddit forums, an often asked question is, is Haskell hard to learn? Usually with the subtext of, will it mean less people develop on Cardano and therefore hamper its growth? As we all know, you can't have a successful video games console without games to play on it, and you can't have a successful smart contract blockchain without dApps to use on it. There's a lot of back and forth over this question. Some people say that Haskell is harder to learn, others say it's just a different way of thinking. In fact, I found this old Reddit post to be a very entertaining back and forth on the subject. But let me just give it to you straight. Yes, Haskell is harder to learn. It's harder to learn if you are new to programming, and it's harder to learn if you've been doing years of imperative programming. The reason why Haskell is hard to learn is that it's a different programming paradigm to what most people are used to or naturally think in. Whereas imperative languages are much more free-flowing and let you do whatever you like for the most part, functional programming languages are rooted in mathematics and hence follow a strong mathematical formulation. Who remembers the good old f of x from calculus and the more advanced g of f of x? Remember the first time you tried to get your head around what it represents only to realize that f of x is just some function applied to x? and that g of f of x would mean yet another function on top of that? You may have gotten frustrated and asked why don't they just say take x, do this, then do this. Well that's a feeling you might have when learning a functional programming language such as Haskell for the first time. One online user explained it as imperative programming just maps naturally to how we think. We perform tasks as a series of steps. If functional programming was natural for most people, a cooking recipe for a pie would look something like this. A pie is 45 minutes of 400 degrees Fahrenheit heat applied to 100 milligrams of final pie dough. 100 milligrams of final pie dough is a mix of 99 milligrams of pie dough, stage 3, and 1 milligrams of salt. 99 milligrams of pie dough, stage 3, is a mix of 79 milligrams of wheat, flour, and 1 egg. That being said, for me personally, thinking about things through a functional paradigm was less of a challenge than simply getting to grips with a syntax. Haskell has its own notation system that is different to most other languages I've worked with. Whereas other languages pay homage to C, the granddaddy of a lot of modern day programming languages, Haskell pays homage to System F, aka Polymorphic Lambda Calculus. Uh, yeah. However, once I got over that hump, I've been finding myself enjoying the learning more and more. You go from looking at a page of Haskell thinking what is going on, to being able to get a sense of what the code does without having to turn to documentation. 
I can, for example, look at this function definition and think, okay, it looks like it takes a list of anything and outputs one of the elements of that list. Whereas the first time I looked at it, I was thinking, what the hell is double colon? What the hell is a minus and right triangle bracket? How does it differ to an equal in a right triangle bracket? Uh, what does the A do? Uh, does it have to be A? Why not B? And so on. In the end, I spent around three to five days just understanding the basics of Haskell, and that helped me hugely. You can find a link to my notes on the front page of my blog. After a few weeks of being on the Plutus Pioneers course and doing my own learning on the side, Haskell is starting to feel a lot more like playing with Lego. Functional programming has a concept of no side effects. So if you see a red rectangular Lego brick, you can be sure it's always going to be a red rectangular Lego brick. It won't change its form after you've built something with it, and if it breaks, it's not going to impact the colour and shape of all the other bricks around it. So you start to appreciate that simplicity after a while. But it's still early days and I've got a lot more to learn, uh, and Plutus could definitely benefit from better documentation, as you'll see from the online exchange I've included at the bottom of my blog. All that being said, what I think we should really be asking is this. Is functional programming a good fit for smart contracts? Part 2. Is functional programming ideal for use in smart contracts? Functional programming is said to reduce the number of bugs in code due to the fact that they instill a deterministic approach. There are no side effects as I mentioned earlier, so if you give a function the same input, you will always get the same output. I decided to look to see if there's any research to support the idea that functional languages have less bugs than imperative ones, and I came across one bit of research that did indicate that they do, albeit somewhat inconclusively. It read, There is a small but significant relationship between language class and defects. Functional languages are associated with fewer defects than either procedural or scripting languages. And then later on, however, we caution the reader that even these modest effects might quite possibly be due to other intangible process factors. For example, the preference of certain personality types for functional static languages that disallow type confusion. However, that research was performed across all GitHub projects, not just specifically for blockchain dApps. So it would be interesting to see that research repeated for just that specific use case. With blockchain programming, code is immutable, which means once it goes live, it is hard to change. You cannot apply a patch to fix things. Updates are possible, but it depends on how the governance model has been set up. For it to be considered decentralized, then you have to have token holders that would have to approve of the changes. This is an important distinction of blockchain programming. If you have a bug in your code and you deploy it, you can't change the original code. It's fixed on the blockchain. Therefore, the imperative is to check, double check, and triple check your code before you deploy it, rather than discovering bugs later. And this is also why you have audit firms that will audit your code for you. The Ethereum blockchain has a long-running history of blockchain bugs. Though, let me stress, bugs can happen on any decentralized application. Ethereum just happens to be the most popular platform right now. Let's briefly take a look at two of the most famous ones. The Ethereum DAO hack. Ethereum's decentralized autonomous organization, aka DAO, was intended to act as an investor-directed venture capital firm. People would buy DAO tokens that would fund the investment vehicle, and in return they would get voting rights on how those funds were deployed. The DAO raised 150 million USD worth of Ether at the time, but then less than three months after its launch, the DAO was hacked and $60 million worth of Ether was stolen. The attack exploited a combination of vulnerabilities in the code. There is an entertaining story of a group of white hat hackers that tried to save these funds. It's worth a read. To quote, We felt like the worst hackers in history. We were foiled by bad internet and family commitments. Now, it's important to stress that this was a bug in the application level, not the underlying Ethereum platform itself. Just like software application running on Windows might have a bug in its code, which has nothing to do with Windows. However, due to the immutability of blockchain code, the hack led to the entire Ethereum blockchain being forked. 
Imagine upgrading everyone to a new version of Windows every time there was a bug in a software application. The philosophical differences of whether forking to get around these types of issues also led to a deep split within the Ethereum community and is why we now have an Ethereum and an Ethereum Classic blockchain. The Ethereum Parity Bug To quote a headline, not again, hackers steal $32 million worth of Ethereum. That's a second major Ether theft this week. The quote is from July 2017 and relates to a bug in the Ethereum wallet known as Parity. And it's not even the main bug that I wanted to discuss. A good write-up of this first exploit can be found here, and it's recommended reading for anyone looking to have a deep understanding of blockchain security. But it was a fix for this exploit that led to the second Parity bug four months later. In November 2017, a user of Ethereum's Parity wallet stumbled upon a way that allowed him to take control of multi-sig wallets, that's wallets that require multiple people to authorize the moving of funds, and he was able to make himself the owner. Stunned by what happened, he then inadvertently killed the contract, immediately rendering all associated wallets unusable, and then later reported the bug as a ticket on Parity's GitHub, simply stating, I accidentally killed it. Millions of dollars were already locked inside hundreds of now frozen wallets with no way to access the ether inside. On November 8th, the company behind Parity released the results of a comprehensive audit, revealing that 578 wallets holding a total of 513,000 ETH were now frozen. Wow, 513,000 ETH, which was worth 280 million USD at the time and 1.2 billion USD at the time of recording this. Interestingly, a large portion of this amount belonged to the lead developer of Parity, a certain Gavin Woods. Yes, the same Gavin Woods that went on to found the rather complex Polkadot blockchain. Parity addressed the situation by saying, following the fix for the original multi-sig issue that had been exploited on the 19th of July, function visibility, a new version of the Parity wallet library contract was deployed on the 20th of July. However, that code still contained another issue. It was possible to turn the Parity wallet library contract into a regular wallet and become an owner of it by calling the init wallet function. Just how prevalent are software bugs in Ethereum smart contracts? Well, this research carried out a year later in 2018 found that on a subset of 3,759 contracts which were sampled for concrete validation and manual analysis, we reproduced real exploits at a true positive rate of 89%, yielding exploits for 3,686 contracts. Our tool finds exploits for the infamous parity bug that indirectly locked $200 million worth of ether. Let me repeat all that in plain English. The researchers found that 89% of the smart contracts that they sampled had bugs in them that could be exploited. No wonder there is a lengthy list of Ethereum smart contract exploits. For blockchain technology to flourish, it needs to mature into a stable and safe industry. Bugs are a much bigger issue than anyone admits. Listen in to the Ethereum developer call on the 23rd of July at the 3540 mark and hear them struggle to answer a simple question of what do we do if we find out that there's a bug after we deploy EIP-1559. Functional programming appears to be somewhat better for reducing bugs, and even imperative languages such as Java have started being more functional-like in recognition of this. And within the world of blockchain where such bugs can result in millions of dollars being lost, I feel functional programming is even more important. The amount of bugs on Ethereum contracts is simply unacceptable. Cardano dApps will be easier for auditors to audit and easier to do formal verification on. This is a process by which you mathematically prove out that the code does what it's expected to do. To quote, put simply, formal verification uses math to specify and analyze a program for errors in logic. However, because of the time and cost involved, Formal verification is best reserved for situations where human life or large sums of money are at stake. 
Currently, formal verification is used to verify the correctness of high-risk code in transportation, the military, and cryptography. Chip companies use it to fortify algorithms before embedding them in silicon, and banks use it to develop financial algorithms. So ask yourself this. If you are choosing to invest hundreds, thousands, or even millions of dollars in a DAP, what worries you more? That the programming language wasn't as easy to pick up for your average programmer, or that the application was built in a robust manner? Now, caveat. Given that Cardano is only just launching its smart contract capability, it remains to be seen how much more bug-free smart contracts built on Cardano are. But Cardano's focus on software security and its choice of Haskell as a language is certainly reassuring. If you like this video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up and hit subscribe, and I'll see you on the next video.